I have a question. When recommending a game to a friend, how do you do it? Do you give them a breakdown of the core gameplay loop or tell them the basic premise of the story? Do you show them a trailer or a let's play of it? Or do you just say, dude, trust me, and hope that will be enough? While all of these approaches can work, I've found that the most effective way to convince someone to check out a game is by comparing it to one I know they like that is similar in some regard. It acts as a simple way to give them an idea of what a title is about while also catering to their interests, as the implication is that because they enjoyed the one game, they'll enjoy this one as well. Comparison is a powerful tool, as it taps into things people already have connections to. And because of this, it has become one of the most common lenses we use to discuss, evaluate, and analyze games through. If I'm trying to quickly find out what a title is like, having it put up next to something I'm familiar with as a point of reference helps ground my understanding of it. Really, this is one of the main ways we learn things, by applying existing knowledge to new concepts. It's in our nature to always be adding to our pool of information, so we have more experiences to pull from that helps us make sense of the world. In regards to video games, comparison is used in many different ways, and it informs how we talk about games both consciously and unconsciously. Of course, the most overt way it comes up in gaming discourse is through categorization. Genres are kind of weird, and a lot of them don't do an adequate job of actually describing what a game is like. For instance, the action genre contains everything from Uncharted to Hades, which is a massive range. And yeah, I can see why both of them could be considered action games on their own, but when lumped together, the distinction feels off, and it doesn't really get to the heart of what they're like. Most of the major genres fall into this trap, because games are too complex to be categorized into something as broad as action, or first-person shooter, or role-playing game. To get anywhere close, you need to dive into subgenres, and even then, those descriptions often feel lacking, as many titles contain elements that could put them in a handful of different categories. And I think this is partly why genres based around significant games have become so common. Common. They pinpoint what a title feels like to play in a more accurate way than other genre descriptions. Roguelikes, Soulslikes, Metroidvanias, Zelda clones, GTA clones, Doom clones, all of these give consumers far more information about what a title will be like than just being told that it's an action game. They give people an experience to call back to. Comparison has seeped into the language we use to talk about games, and it comes up constantly, from casual conversations, to reviews, to trailers, and other forms of marketing. While it does seem like this approach to classifying games has gotten more popular in recent years, it really has been a part of gaming culture since the beginning, most notably with the adventure genre, named after the text-based title Colossal Cave Adventure. It inspired countless text-based games and eventually evolved into titles like Grim Fandango and Monkey Island. These games weren't presented solely through text, but they still share a lot of the same DNA in terms of solving puzzles through specific interactions with items and the environment. Now, the biggest issue with the adventure genre is it's been almost 50 years since the original game came out, and the term adventure is less associated with the game and more so with the idea of going on a journey and exploring dangerous and exciting places. Over time, this very specific genre melded with the general understanding of the word adventure. So while it does still include titles that resemble the spirit of the original game, like Life is Strange and Telltale's The Walking Dead, it also has been co-opted by games that just feature grand adventures, which frankly is most of them. And that's one of the main problems that comes from using a single game as the basis for a genre. As time passes, it gets easier to move away from the original meaning. Now, I don't think most game-based genres will ever become as nebulous as the adventure genre has, as most aren't associated with a word as broad as adventure, but all of them do have the potential to lose some meaning as time goes on. This can be pretty clearly seen with the roguelike genre. Originally, titles with this classification were simply like the game Rogue, so turn-based dungeon crawlers with randomized level layouts, power-ups that augment the way each run goes, and permadeath that sends players back to the start. In these kinds of games, the only thing players carry with them from one run to the next is a better understanding of the various systems. The thing is, this version of the genre is sort of dead. There are very few modern titles that fit the original criteria, but instead of the genre falling into obscurity, the name began to be applied to games that incorporated just some roguelike elements, so stuff like Spelunky, Binding of Isaac, and Rogue Legacy. These games moved away from Rogue's turn-based roots, among other things, but a lot of folks started to consider them to be roguelikes as well. In turn, this led to a backlash from longtime fans of the genre, and eventually the distinction of roguelite was born, which at first was just meant to be applied to games that did 
didn't stick to the strict criteria of a traditional roguelike. As time has gone on though, the popular understanding of both roguelike and roguelite has shifted, where now, to a lot of people, the main difference between the two is that roguelites are centered around permanent character upgrades, where roguelikes aren't, for the most part at least. There are a lot of gray areas. Obviously, there are still plenty who stick to the original definition, but as there aren't many traditional roguelikes breaking into the mainstream market, it feels like a bit of a losing battle for them. As for the more modern understanding of the two genres, the distinction between them is important, because the way they handle progression make them play very differently and often draw in separate audiences. Personally, I really struggle with games that don't have a strong sense of persistent progression, so I've never really gotten into stuff like Slay the Spire or Spelunky, whereas I have dropped over 100 hours in Hades because I felt like each run, no matter how horribly I failed, was building to something. Making these distinctions may seem pedantic, but there are a lot of people who really like one but not the other, so being able to know what they're getting into holds a ton of value. When too many games are put into a single category, it expands the definition of that category, and without proper classifiers, where a genre starts and ends can become unclear. And I think that is why older fans of roguelikes get so frustrated by the current way we use the classification, as it no longer really resembles the title they originally fell in love with. Clearly, using a single game as the basis of a genre doesn't make it immune to the issues more general classifications have, but as long as the game being referenced is still a popular touchstone, it is more effective than other quick definitions. However, the mere fact that the games that get used as a comparison point the most often are also some of the most beloved titles of all time presents its own problems, mainly with how they can mess with a person's expectations. It can be hard for a lot of games to live up to the titles they get compared to, regardless of how good they are. Saying a game is like Shadow of the Colossus carries a lot of weight, and even when that is an accurate description, it sets the bar arguably a bit too high, because part of what made Shadow of the Colossus so special was how unique it was, so any game that is said to be like it won't have that same genre-defining magic. Players setting unrealistic expectations for what a game will be like is further compounded by how these kinds of comparisons, by their very nature, are reductive. Typically, they are centered around both titles sharing a select few traits, and just having a couple things in common won't always lead to games feeling the same, which can be met with a fair bit of disappointment. The reductive nature of these comparisons have other consequences as well, especially when looking at the titles that have turned into genres, what often becomes designated as the core essence of a title is a very narrow slice of what it actually is, and a lot of these understandings have already become how we look at these games. So when a title is said to be like Dark Souls, the assumption most will make is that it's hard. If it's like Zelda, they'll guess there will be puzzles and dungeons. If it's like Super Metroid, they'll expect a large interconnected map that requires getting upgrades in order to progress. Of course, each of these titles is far more than that. Those single elements are not the only or even most important thing about them, but it is often what they get boiled down to when used in gaming discourse. Even though I do think simplifying what a game is about in this way causes a handful of issues, I get why it's so difficult to shake. Like, just saying that a game is hard doesn't evoke nearly as much emotion as directly comparing it to Dark Souls. Calling a game tough doesn't make me feel much, but saying it's like Dark Souls brings me right back to my 20th failed attempt against Ornstein and Smo. Regardless of them being understood as meaning the same thing, one is tied to a specific experience, while the other is abstract. So it makes sense that people would want to lean into their pro that will most likely grab someone's attention. To be clear, while it is an effective way to pique someone's interest, the fact that it strips away other important aspects of a game shouldn't be ignored, as it risks players approaching them with the wrong mindset and causes comparisons to be less robust than they could be. There is a lot of room for misunderstanding and miscommunication. At the end of the day, all of us are individual beings with our own base of knowledge and experiences that color the way we look at things. Despite there being some common understandings of what certain comparisons may mean, nothing is definitive. And really, it isn't enough to just look at the two things being compared. It's also important to look at the person making the comparison. Knowing what they value and how they look at things is a vital piece of information. Games are massive endeavors that can be similar to each other in a multitude of ways, and the aspects that any given player will connect to most can vary immensely from person to person, which undoubtedly impacts what they view the core of a game to be. For instance, consider Elden Ring. It's a title with a massive scope that combines a ton of familiar ideas together to create an experience that is really unlike any game before it. In order to liken it to other titles, you pretty much need to hone in on one of its major aspects instead of the game as a whole. And when doing so, people are most likely going to view things through the lens of what was most important to them. So for those who love the combat and bosses, they will
They would obviously say it's like other FromSoft games, as well as stuff like Jedi Fallen Order and Neo, which all have a heavy focus on difficult but fair combat. For those who feel most attached to the open world, they may say it's similar to The Witcher 3, Red Dead Redemption 2, or Ghost of Tsushima, as all of them have sizable maps to explore and get lost in. For those who dig its approach to storytelling, they may say to check out Hollow Knight or even Journey, due to how they tell their stories through their environments and cryptic messages hidden around the world. Personally, the aspect of Elden Ring that I resonate with most is the sense of freedom that comes from how the main quest and world are structured. So I would compare it to stuff like A Short Hike, Outer Wilds, and Breath of the Wild, as despite the majority of those titles barely resembling Elden Ring in terms of gameplay or aesthetic, they all gave me the same feeling when playing them. One where I was rewarded for my curiosity and driven by the joy of discovery. Depending on what matters to a person, Elden Ring can be like a lot of games. The comparisons I make may be entirely different than the ones someone else does, and without the full context of why I view it the way I do, the games I see as being similar could make absolutely no sense to others. When these kinds of comparisons are used in a setting that has space to go into detail, like conversations between friends or long-form videos, it is easy enough for someone to elaborate on what a comparison is trying to accomplish. However, that isn't how we encounter most comparisons of this nature. A lot of the time they are presented and also consumed with little to no context. Online we are constantly bombarded by tweets and headlines that don't have the space to examine nuances or intricacies, and many people who engage with them never take the time to look into the deeper context text by starting a conversation or reading an article. Instead, they just react to the tiny bit of information they see. Even in formats like reviews or video essays that do have the space to explain things further, many creators seem to assume that the comparisons they make will be understood by everyone, too often leaving complex ideas unexplored and unexplained, putting it on the audience to try to guess what was meant, and leaving the door open for things to be misunderstood. Comparisons of this nature aren't an exact science, and the reality is we are all too caught up in our own experiences to ever agree on an objective definition of what goes into a genre, especially ones that are hastily put together like Souls Likes. When it comes to gaming discourse both in person and online, people mostly operate on vibes, so comparisons will almost always be rooted in their own experiences. The trend of describing a title as being like X has become so popular because it's easy, it's comfortable. At its best, it can get across a solid amount of information in a somewhat concise way, and even though it leaves a a lot of room for miscommunication, it takes far less effort than trying to fully explain what a game is like on its own. The fancy term to describe why this happens is heuristics, which essentially are the mental shortcuts we use to make decisions and come to conclusions without having to rely on an abundance of brain power. There are various forms of heuristics, but all of them in some way are about simplifying information. We strive to find the familiar in a thing, and reach for comparisons to it, regardless of whether or not it's one that makes all that much sense. And really this goes beyond just classifying games. It also impacts our perception of the stuff we play, oftentimes on a subconscious level. For instance, one of the most common forms of heuristics is the availability heuristic, which pretty much is when we use easy to recall information to inform our thought process. One of the ways this takes form is by comparing experiences that happen in close proximity to each other, even when it isn't all that great of a comparison. For example, I played Ghost of Tsushima right after finishing The Last of Us Part 2, and during the first major battle, I remember feeling that the way ghosts portrayed violence almost seemed comical. Through playing The Last of Us Part II, I had grown used to every combat encounter being a display of brutality. So much weight is given to every fight, and the most reliable way of taking out enemies is by getting up close and personal, which is when that weight is felt the most. There's an almost claustrophobic sense to how violence is utilized in The Last of Us Part II, so going from that to Ghost of Tsushima where the camera is pulled out a bit more and Jin is able to cut through enemies with ease felt jarring. Honestly, it took me a while before I could take the game seriously because of that disconnect. The ironic thing is that Ghost of Tsushima is incredibly gruesome in its own right, and its depiction of violence plays a major and powerful role in the story. But when subconsciously comparing it to my experience with The Last of Us Part II, it didn't feel nearly as consequential as it should have. An even odder example of this happened to me when I was learning how to do a 16 star speedrun of Super Mario 64 around the same time that I was replaying Breath of the Wild. Spending pretty much any moment just running during a 16 star 
our run is a waste of time. So for the most part, players will always be chaining together long jumps and dives to move around the world as quickly as possible. Due to the constant repetition of playing the same levels over and over again, trying to learn how to chain moves together, I got used to the feeling of always propelling my character forward. So whenever I would switch over to Breath of the Wild, I found myself getting frustrated by the lack of movement options. I wanted to long jump with Link so badly, despite it not being a mechanic that has ever been a part of a 3D Zelda game. Not intentionally, at least. Comparing the movement of a Mario title to a Zelda title is a silly thing to do, as the two are trying to achieve wildly different things. But I couldn't help but make it because of how much time I was spending trying to learn how to play Mario 64 efficiently. These frustrations I had with Ghost of Tsushima and Breath of the Wild weren't a fault of the games themselves. It was the fault of what I had grown used to playing beforehand. These sorts of involuntary comparisons happen for me all the time. In fact, years ago, one of them led to me making a video about what the Mass Effect series could learn from Darkest Dungeon, an idea that stemmed from me being frustrated that Mass Effect's combat didn't provide long-term consequences in the way Darkest Dungeons did. And I never would have come up with that idea if I hadn't been playing the two at the same time. Comparisons like this aren't necessarily good or bad, they're just something that happens. Looking back at that video, I think it discusses some interesting ideas, and while at the end of the day, it is pretty much just me pitching a game that would be impossible to make, it was a fun thought experiment. I mostly just wish that at the time I had recognized why I was comparing them. Now I try really hard to be conscious about how my recent experiences may affect each other, but it can be surprisingly easy to miss. As hard as we may try, we don't view games in a vacuum. Frankly, I think knowing the title a reviewer played before the one they're actually reviewing has a surprising amount of value to it, as it helps give a little more context about the lens they use to look at a game. Now, with everything I've talked about so far, the focus has been on the ways comparison influences our experiences with and understandings of games. But there is another way that comparison is frequently used in gaming discourse that barely has anything to do with either of those things. And that, of course, is comparing games to determine which one is the best. It's a natural urge to want the games that you like to be considered good by other people. When you feel connected to a title, there is a strange sense of ownership that comes with it. And for a lot of folks, this ends up taking the form of arguing with others about whose favorite game is better, regardless of if the games are similar at all. From Game of the Year awards to tier lists to fights deep within Twitter threads, we constantly put titles up against each other. And it is a way of talking about games that people can't seem to get enough of. Like, it's been four years, and I still see people pitting God of War 2018 up against Red Dead Redemption 2 just because they came out around the same time. Aside from both having some cinematic qualities, they really have nothing in common. So arguing about which is better seems fruitless because they are trying to do different things. These kinds of discussions don't really add value to the greater gaming landscape, but people like to have them because they're kind of fun. Going to bat for games you like feels good, especially when other people join in and validate your opinion. Unfortunately, it does lead to a ridiculous amount of fanboy toxicity, which, you know, isn't great. While I get people being passionate about the games they like, there is a way to express that without putting other games or people down. In fact, that seems like one of the least effective ways to praise a game. The amount of times I've seen people come out with takes like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is better than Persona 5, or Sonic is better than Mario, is staggering. And I always walk away from hearing these things being like, okay, but why? Why measure how much you like a thing by comparing it to something else that isn't even that similar? For the most part, I think it stems from that idea of people wanting their favorite things to be widely considered as the best. And when they see something else get more praise, they take it personally and frame their feelings about the game they adore in relation to the one they don't. Because of the strong connection with the game they love, many feel like anything that they perceive as an attack on it is personal. Of course, there are also a lot of people who just really like to shit talk and enjoy ruffling feathers. Overall, this isn't meant to be a condemnation of these kinds of comparisons. Obviously, you shouldn't be toxic about it, but just having the urge to make them is understandable. To be clear, I'm guilty of doing it too, both in videos and casual conversations. Just recently, I played Symphony of the Night for the first time, and when I finished it, I actively had to stop myself from tweeting that Super Metroid was better. In fairness, I think this comparison makes a bit more sense than a lot of others as the two share a lot of the same DNA. There's a good conversation to be had about why I think certain aspects worked in Super Metroid that didn't in Symphony of the Night. Also, a comparison like this could be useful for someone who hasn't played either and wants to know which is worth spending their time and money on. But if I'm being honest, my impulse to make that tweet wasn't so I could have a bigger conversation about the game or help inform potential buyers. It was to make a pithy 
you remark about how a classic I've liked for a while is superior to a different one that I thought was just okay. It's an all too common and ugly instinct that adds confrontation to a space that really doesn't need any more than it already has. Now, I don't expect comparisons like this to stop. They often come from an emotional place that is difficult to filter. Also, you know, we partially live on the internet now, and there will always be a wealth of people looking to get a rise out of someone else. However, I do think it's important to recognize that these kinds of comparisons aren't an effective way to have a better understanding of games. They mostly just give a platform to find validation from other like-minded people and spend some time arguing with those whose opinions differ, which is its own form of entertainment. Ultimately, comparison is pretty much unavoidable. We're hardwired to to do it, and not using it as a tool really only makes life more difficult. So by no means am I trying to advocate for people to stop comparing games to each other. I'm gonna keep doing it. However, I think it's important to be aware of how comparison affects us, how it influences the ways we think and talk about games. It is a tool that can be extremely useful, but also without proper consideration can get in the way of good communication. There are a lot of reasons why this matters, but one of the biggest is that the language around games Games is still so young, and we are coming up with new terms and classifications rapidly. The way we talk about games today will have an impact on how people talk about them in the future. So if we're more thoughtful now, games and discussions around them will be better in the long run. But also, you know, I'm not your dad. Compare Dark Souls to Kirby for all I care, I can't stop you. What I can do though, is tell you about this video's sponsor, NordVPN. Look. It's current year and a VPN is a good thing to have. They encrypt your traffic, make it so your internet provider won't throttle your connection, let you access various regions around the world to be able to watch stuff that isn't available where you are, and a bunch of other stuff. And NordVPN makes this really easy to do. You just pull up the app, click where you want to connect, and boom, you're there. You can search the internet in peace and, you know, watch The Mummy on Netflix, regardless of whether or not you live in Canada. What really sets NordVPN apart, though, is that it now has anti-malware features with its threat protection, which you can turn on and it blocks intrusive ads and trackers and scans downloads and URLs that may be sketchy. So aside from what you get from it just being a VPN, it also adds another layer of cybersecurity. If you go to nordvpn.com slash resbutinvpn, which is in the description, you can sign up for the service and get an extra four months for free. They have a 30 day money back guarantee, so you can always test it out for yourself and see the ways it can help your daily internet browsing. All in all, NordVPN is a great service that offers a ton of utility. So to make the internet a bit safer for you, check them out. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. For those still here, hey. I'd like to give a big thank you to my patrons who make this channel possible, as well as a special shout out to William Glenn 8 and KK for being honorary bag butins. I appreciate you all. Have a good day and or night, and I'll see you in the next one.